Yeah, got it. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Birders Show. Uh, as always, please do remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell down below, and check out our Patreon link in the description to find out more about our mission to make birding more accessible to people and to support the production of the show. Uh, I'm joined, as always, from Medellin, Colombia, by my co-host, Diego Calderon. Diego, nice to see you again. Hey, buenas tardes, mate. How's it going? All, all great here in Medellin. Super happy to be back on another nice, nice episode of The Birders Show. How are you doing? I can hit... I can hear the birds singing in your garden. I can always hear the birds singing in your garden. Uh, rufous colored sparrow, there's been a yellow-bellied seed eater, Colombian chachalacas were around, so yeah, you can hear them, indeed. I can always hear them. I need to start a separate e-bird list, birds I hear over Zoom while talking to Diego. We can do, yeah, we can do that. We can get, you know, a special account for the birder show and, and, and get to account for those, you know? Yeah, that would be quite fun. I think we still have one from when we did uh, the Global Bird Weekend last year, the Global Big Day. There you are, there you are, there you are. And, and this year also we have to to, to, to have one. So what, what's what's you been up to, mate? What's been birding around for you? No, I've mostly been birding around the Bogota area uh, recently. Uh, I was, well, you know where I've been. You know the place I go every every other weekend, <laughs> birding, to Chicaque Park, which is my favorite place to go birding Yay! in Bogota. Yay! <laughs> This is not this is not paid. This is not paid advertising by Chikaki. It's just a great spot and you love it. No, if if anything, I'm one of their biggest investors, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, always always nice birds out there. Um what about you? I mean you've been bouncing around all over the world. Where have you been recently? I've been doing some stuff, fortunately, you know, everything is kind of reactivating. So I was I was uh, fortunate enough to be invited on a farm trip by the Instituto Costarricense de Turismo to Costa Rica. You know, the country is is reactivating. So we were touring around the country for a week and a half having tremendous beautiful birds and amazing you know lifers great great trip so fun to see you know so much so many good friends and actually one of the cool things is that I, I i took time at the end of the trip to catch up with a couple of friends that you know uh are not from costa rica but are living right now in costa rica and you know by pure chance we have one of these persons today in the bird show we do indeed. Well, I mean, that's as good a moment as any to introduce today's guest. We're joined today in the Birdie Show studio by uh, Richard Prom, the acclaimed author and evolutionary ornithologist who teaches at Yale, uh, the author of the 2017 book, The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choices Shapes the Natural World and Us, and an upcoming book entitled The Beauty of Birds. So, uh, well, without further ado, uh, Rick, welcome to The Birdie Show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be uh, chatting uh, with you and Diego. Now, get, let me get this right. You're Richard on book covers, but Diego always calls you Rick. So I guess Rick is, is, is what I can call you. Rick is appropriate. Yes, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, Rick, probably the first question I have to ask you really for everybody watching at home is uh, the evolution of beauty. This is where maybe people who are watching at home will be familiar with your work um, and or, or can go out and get the book and become familiar with it. But could you talk us through just a little bit to start with? Well, there's Diego holding up the copy. There we go. Um, I have a different one. I have a copy with a great Argus pheasant on the front, I think. But um, uh, just could you maybe explain just a little bit about what's the what's the concept behind the evolution of beauty? What's for, for a complete layman who doesn't really know much about the subject? What, how would you explain the book? Well, uh, the evolution of beauty is really about uh, how birds are uh, through their social and sexual choices are agents in their own evolution. And, and so it's really about the consequence of a mate choice, uh, birds picking who they prefer as mates and, and, and how that uh, influences the evolution of birds. Um, in a way, it's a continuing up, as the title implies, picking up on an original aesthetic view of mate choice uh, that was championed by Darwin. The idea that birds choose their mates based on uh, what they like. Right, and that this uh, leads to the evolution of ornament in nature. Now, um, uh, this idea, which was originally Darwinian, authentically Darwinian, if you will, has been kind of uh, uh, drummed out of science uh, over the last uh, century and a half. And that's an unfortunate thing. So I'm really trying to revitalize and, uh, a view of evolutionary biology as an aesthetic 
process in nature. Um, the bottom line is that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves. And uh, regardless of you know what we think of them, of course, that drives and our attraction and certainly my personal and professional interest in, in ornithology. So it's um, a book about that core idea that's influenced my research and, uh, and the implications of it. Actually, actually, let me jump there, Rick, because you know there, there is there is this gap in between probably Darwin and nowadays that you took this more seriously and and wrote about it. Why do you think this was a little forgotten and we were on the adaptationist, you know, natural selection easier easier world, if you want to call it like that? Yeah. Why, why so, was that? So what what happened was that Darwin's idea that uh, a mate choice, especially female mate choice, was a force in nature. Uh, really freaked people out in the Victorian world. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, you know, <laughs> pe people are still having troubles uh, wrapping their heads around it. And, and um, essentially, you know, the, the, the original evolutionary generation, the readers of the origin, uh, uh, were often antagonistic to Darwin's idea about, about mate choice uh, because they because they uh, really saw it as um, uh, 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 as uh, undermining the success of the idea of adaptation by natural selection. And so there has been a big uh, history over the last more than a century of people trying to reinterpret mate choice as a kind of adaptation, as a form of natural selection. And this led to the idea of what we call honest advertisement, the idea that, you know, redder is better, that organisms are making their mate choices in order to improve, in order to get better. And this is kind of a way of taking beauty in nature and putting it under the control of, of a rational idea. And Darwin's idea was originally, you know, uh, uh, sort of irrational. It's about subjectivity, about desire and passion in the natural world, as forces in the natural world. Tough, tough for him, like coming out of the closet with these ideas, you know, in his time. Well, certainly he was, uh, uh, you know, deeply troubled by the huge cultural and social implications of of, of his own work. Uh, but you know, that's why that's why he was so hesitant to publish and throughout his career. But um, uh, but fortunate for us, he he uh, he, he managed to, uh, to to do it. One of the goals of the book is to try to uh, recognize and open up. Uh, something that birders know, which is about the cognitive complexity and the the uh, you know the beauty of birds, right? So for me, it's really about bringing my uh, birding roots and my science together uh, in a way uh, as a as a as a form of uh, you know. Uh, you know, science plus. <laughs> it's still this hardcore science, but it's about <laughs> the uh, organisms themselves, you know. But actually going back to your to your birding roots that you just mentioned, um, let's talk about that. How did you first become interested in birds? I, I, I read in the book that you're a bit like me, a birder from a young age. How did you first become passionate about birds? I got my first pair of glasses in, in fourth grade and the, the world, uh, you know, came into focus. And in a few short months, I was a bird watcher, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I, 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 I can't imagine that that was accidental uh, until um, I started thinking and, 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 and watching birds, thinking about and watching birds. I, um, I did a you know, bunch of sort of amorphously nerdy things like uh, memorize records from the Guinness Book of Records and <laughs> world records and, and, you know, things like that. I, I think I had a turtle phase. I really wanted a pet turtle. And, uh, but, uh, but somehow or other, like, so a lot of things were sort of available, but, but birds really took over. And that was about, in, you know, uh, about 10 years old. And, and by, you know, a, a year or two later, I had a life list and in, in a way, a life plan, you know, it, it wasn't really very explicit, but, you know, I knew it would be sort of a bird filled life. Right. Uh, <laughs> of course, uh, uh, I didn't know much about science. I didn't imagine that I'd become a scientist. Even into college, I imagined that I would be uh, kind of a refuge manager or, you know, something like that. I didn't really know <laughs> that ornithology was an active scientific, uh, you know, thing. Um, but uh, in college, I realized that evolutionary biology was really the area of science that was about what I was most fascinated about birds, diversity, its origin and maintenance. And... Um, uh, and, you know, I've been sort of uh, hooked ever since. 
So you mentioned uh, how you kind of came across the ideas of uh, ornithology, evolutionary ornithology in college. And looking at your book, it seems that sort of in the early 80s, just after college or maybe during college, you, you headed off to first Suriname and then Peru and then Ecuador in search of, well, a family of birds that I see Diego is wearing a T-shirt in tribute of today, the mannequins. Oh, indeed. Indeed. You know, I know. I know we were going to be with Rick, so, I mean, i got to have a mannequin or a cutting or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's bad, like, see, all my mannequin t-shirts are in the wash, so exactly. what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, mine too. Why didn't I think of that? When I was an undergrad, one of the things I really got interested in was phylogeny, you know, reconstructing phylogeny, which was like a radical and kind of new idea at that point. And and I really was also interested in in in. Uh, in bird watching and in, in, in knowing and experiencing biodiversity in the field. So, you know, after I graduated, um, I concocted this plan to go to Suriname uh, in, and to map out mannequin leks. I was interested in, you know, why different species had different size of leks. And, and of course, that set me up for this marvelous research program, ultimately, in uh, phylogenetic ethology, or studying the behavior of birds in the context of their, the, you know, their phylogeny, who's related to whom. And, and that was um, uh, a great excuse to go birding, <laughs> you know, basically anywhere in the neotropics where the family I was studying, the mannequins, uh, lived. So, um, uh, you know, I didn't admit it to my, uh, my advisors, uh, but sometimes my proposals about what to do next were driven by, uh, <laughs> by birding, right? So after spending a lot of time in, uh, in, in, in Suriname, uh, uh, describing the corporate displays of uh, white-throated mannequin and white-fronted mannequins, uh, essentially for the first time, um, I had in grad school an opportunity for a next bout of fieldwork, and I decided to work on the golden-winged mannequin, Masius chrysopterus. And the main reason was that uh, it lived in the Andes, and I was desperate <laughs> to get to the Andes and see some birds. So uh, at that point, uh, you know, gold-winged mannequin was known essentially from museum drawers and from a handful of bird watchers, right? It was a very poorly known. The song was not described. There were no recordings of the songs in the Library of Natural Sounds at Cornell or at Blows and at, at the uh, CBC, at the uh, uh, BBC. And so, uh, um, you know, it, it was poorly known. So uh, in order to study it, I had to go basically to places where from museum records, you knew it was gonna exist and bird watch my way through the avifauna until we found the bird, right? And this uh, was an enormously uh, fun thing to do and challenging um, and uh, super rewarding. And, uh, you know, now we have these things in our pockets that we can pull up an app and whip out the, the you know, the yeah. song and know all that. But, you know, in those days, there weren't any books, uh, useful books uh, uh, to, to hold portions, huge portions of, uh, of, of the neotropics. And so uh, it was a real challenge, but a real joy. So that, that combination of science and birding has always been core to my uh, you know, motivation as, a, well, as an ornithologist. I was, I was actually going to go into that point, Rick, because you know, I, I've been fortunate to kind of follow your steps in the, in the past. You know, I went with Marina and Science, that was where one of your students looking for golden wind mannequin legs in, in Ecuador and stuff like that. But there is, there is, there is this, this point, this middle point, where the bird watcher and the scientist have, have to get in equilibrium because you can go birding all day long and you know having fun and as, as you did in Suriname and Ecuador, but you also have to be reading the forest in a different way, like looking for potential perches, potential branches and, and roots and stuff where these mannequins are you know expected to be uh, using them as, as arenas. How, 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 I mean, how do you balance that as a bird watcher and a, and a scientist? Like you spend yeah. hours and hours and hours taking notes yeah. and that's, that's tough, that's boring, but at the same time, it's super rewarding, you know, academically. <laughs> how do you play with that? Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you definitely, once you find the bird, once you're starting to do a study and behavior of a particular species, you have to rein in 
you got to, uh, you know, rein in the birder. You're still using your birder's <laughs> kills. You're watching individual birds in the life, right? But you got, you got, to, you got to keep it under control. And so um, you can't just say, "Oh, I've seen this one. What else is around?" And try to add up your your you work, right? Uh, yeah. And but you know what I found is that, and I have spent uh, days and days and weeks watching individual birds. Um, you know, uh, and the result, of course, were publications, which I was interested in, but also, um, you know, investment in um, deeply understanding, you know, uh, 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 birds. And, and uh, um, you know, that was uh, that was f- uh, frustrating at times. Uh, and I wish my life list had been <laughs> faster in those six months that I would spend in Ecuador or, or wherever. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it, it was, it was, it was a professional, uh, a professionally. Necessary. I really found it, right. I found it really fascinating in the book as well, because you kind of touched on it in that answer, but this idea of birding that those of us as younger modern birders can't really relate to with Merlin and eBird and all these things that, you know, you're preparing for a trip by studying birds in museum drawers and the way to discover the bird is basically, as you say in the book, it's like a process of elimination. You go out, you figure out what bird's making what sound until you realize what call the bird you're looking for makes. It's kind of remarkable to imagine birding that way, especially in the tropics where there's such a wealth of species all around you. Right, right. And, and you know, and we found, it, it, I, I found that in those days, it took about uh, two weeks uh, to find an unknown bird <laughs> in an Amazona, <laughs> knowing it's there without a song. You know, that was the average because I've done it uh, a, a, a whole number of times, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and sometimes you were really lucky. And, you know, it was ironic. And one works on the uh, uh, Heterocircus uh, flavoverdix, which is, I think, yellow crayon mannequin. As soon as I get to Brownsville, Texas, yeah, a lot of my, a lot of a lot of my bird names turn over into scientific names. So, uh, in, in in on the Ventuari River in in, in southern uh, Venezuela. Uh, and it was very poorly known. And uh, it took us about two weeks to find it. And, and, and the, the song was just, it finally we found it, it was extraordinary. This explosive, it's like a, it's like a screaming piha, only small, right? It goes, you know, you know, with this explosive, right? And, uh, and, and very different from both other members of the genus, a really distinct thing. And then, you know, when we finally found it, we were sitting at, uh, at lunch one day after working on the individual we'd found, and we're sitting at lunch, and we hear it <laughs> at, 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 at our, where we were, where, where we were staying at the breakfast and lunch and dinner table, right? So it was like it was like right there, and we found another one that was only like a hundred yards away, fifty yards away from where we were staying, right? So so uh, you know it, it does take long, but then you know those birds are seeing, they're vocalizing. You could pick them up, if, but of course that that's um, hard to experience now. Of course, there are plenty of birds for whom we. Uh, or not plenty. Uh, there are some birds where you have no no data, but these, of course, are you know extraordinarily rare now. Uh, we've tracked down almost all the uh, you know uh, primary you know bird vocalizations of birds of the world, which is of course a great achievement. But even in your time, like we're, we're, no data for vocalizations, but if you knew the sister tax of vocalizations, you know, like knowing Kora people, how Kora people vocalize, help you to find golden wing manakin masius in Ecuador, you know, like. That's similar. That sounds similar. Yeah, sure, sure. It's, and it's really interesting. Of course, that varies. If you look at the genus Lepidothrix, where, uh, you know, blue crown mannequin, all these, uh, all these, all of its relatives, they sound really similar. Hiccuper, hiccuper, you know, they're like, like really, really similar. Uh, but you go to white crown mannequin and you find, you know, every single time you go to a new mountain, a new drainage, it, it's got a totally different song, right? So, of course, we're doing work on that, showing that there, there, there are a lot of species of white crown <laughs> mannequin, you know, more more than 10, uh, all lumped now into one species. These wild vocalization types are evolutionarily very distinct. So, so um, yeah, you can use that information, but in, say, in heterocircus mannequins, the, 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 the vocalizations of e- each species are really quite different. So going back to, to the book and, and the chapters you dedicate to mannequins, um, there are 54, I think, 54 species of mannequins, and if we don't include the sort of 10 lumped species and things like that that you're, you're talking about. But why sort of in a more kind of layman terms for someone like me who's not quite on the scientific level of you guys, but why are all these mannequins so radically different visually in their lecking displays and their calls, yet they all originate from the same, the same bird, right, way back in the past? We have this concept in uh, evolutionary 
biology of adaptive radiation, right? So it was like our phrase for describing what Darwin was envisioning when uh, uh, he, he, he hypothesized that all of the Galapagos finches had evolved in their diversity in isolation on these little islands from a single common ancestor, right? So adaptive radiation captures the idea of, uh, of the, uh, the breadth of diversity achieved through adaptation, right? From a single form. And uh, so we imagine uh, Chiragiformi, shorebirds and, and their relatives, right? It's a great example of adaptive radiation. But the mannequins are really an example of what I call aesthetic radiation, right? Their ecologies differ, but not extremely. Uh, what really has varied and, and driven their diversity is mate choice and sexual selection. The fact that they diversified extensively in, in how they advertise themselves uh, and how uh, uh, mates are chosen. So this is really a, a group in which we can understand those processes uh, really well. And, uh, you know, the answer is, you know, uh, female mannequins do all the parental care. They build the nest, lay the eggs, you know, raise the young on their own, and they choose among available mates. But that gives them the opportunity to choose whoever they want. And that is a perfect example of of how uh, beauty evolves or co-evolves because their preferences and the male's uh, display are co-evolving with one another. So that history uh, uh, in mannequins has led to this explosive uh, diversity in, uh, in, in, in what, what is beautiful, right? It's like high fashion, uh, but in a genetic uh, uh, system with millions of years. Actually, actually you know, this, this fashion, this fashion concept is, is, is pretty unique and it's pretty interesting because, you know, you, you, you come to mannequins again, you know, like you come to this mannequin, club wind mannequin, and you can see that, you know, the, the very unique structure of the, of the bones of the wing, you know, like the ulna, is, is totally, you know, unique and different to make this sonation, this stridulation, these mechanical noises that they do. But one of the, one of the crazy things that, that you have to explain us a little bit more is, like this is also affecting females. Like the female choice is, is also affecting their, their morphology because these things are, let's say, codified into the, into the embryos before the embryo knows if it's gonna be a male or a female. So these changes are evolutionary, not adaptative. Sometimes are, are deleterious almost sometimes. Like what the fuck is going on, man? Like tell us more, you know, it's absolutely <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there, are few, there are few birds that are more likely to, uh, to uh, drive you to ask that question <laughs> than club wing mannequin. But, uh, but indeed, so this is a bird, uh, it, you know, we can tap in the sound if you want uh, later, you know. Oh, we, we, we can reproduce it here while I was it's, asking. It's, uh, 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 sure, exactly. And so the club wing mannequin is endemic to uh, Western uh, Colombia and Ecuador and uh, has an extraordinary wing sound. So like other mannequins, it's polygynous, right? The males do displays, the females do all the parental care. Um, and the males gather in these sort of loose associations or uh, uh, dispersed leks to, to display. Uh, and instead of singing all the time, they make this wing sound. And that wing sound uh, is, is extraordinary. Uh, and it really drives, uh, um, uh, you know, our, well, our curiosity. So uh, it took us actually, uh, I first saw that bird in 1985. It took until uh, 2005 for us to publish any papers on how it makes that sound. This is the work of uh, Kim Bostwick, yeah. uh, who is a student of mine and now, uh, you know, uh, later at Cornell University. And, and, uh, and she showed that it was a kind of stridulation, that the feathers are interacting. One feather, as the, as the wings vibrate, is rubbing against the other, causing that feather to, to, to ring, uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the frequency of the sound. So it was an extraordinarily weird way uh, to, to, to make a sound, especially considering that birds have been singing songs. Uh, birds have been singing songs for, um, uh, you know, uh, 100 million years. There you are, right? I mean, there really. are, like, you so, know, they're, they're, yeah. they're sacrifi so, so, sacrificing the main, you know, right. signal for a new one. Right. So, th so, so this is a way of showing that beauty and innovation of beauty can be innovative, right? It can, be, it can, it can add, it's not just uh, stuff happening or beauty happening in this case, it's really innovative. 
right? But there's more to this story, and, and our curiosity uh, drove us to ask, well, you know, uh, you know, how do they make this sound? And then later, you know, what do they, how have they evolved to make it? What is the body change? And this is really the work of Kim Bostwick. And she showed that the wing bones of the male, in order to make the sound that they produce, or the ulna in particular, the trailing edge bone, is, is enormous and solid, you know, like ivory, right? It's just, and it's got these huge quill knobs on it to hold on to the, the, the feathers during this process. It's extraordinary. And clearly, uh, yeah, yeah, they are. Those are, they're the, they're, they're the weirdest wing bones in, in, in AVs, right? Uh, 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 and, and, and uh, you know, they even, I mean, they almost is, almost ex exceed uh, a, a penguin in their, you know, in their robustness or their sturdiness, right? So, so clearly this has caused a cost to the males. They don't fly as well because they've got to do this uh, weird song, but that could be considered just the cost of being business. It's what uh, many adaptation, adaptations have called a handicap, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be just a handicap, which means that the males are uh, investing, it's a cost of doing business, right? They invest a lot in order to get those mates. Uh, but um, uh, what we discovered is that the females also have extraordinarily weird wing bones. They are almost as big and almost as thick, uh, uh, and they're not quite as, they're not completely solid, but they're certainly thicker, made up of more calcium. And so the females are being made worse. So I, I think this is in the, in the kind of intellectual uh, chess game against adaptationism. This is like checkmate. There, you know, nobody can argue that, 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 that this is not a case of, uh, of, um, uh, of, uh, you know, arbitrariness or non-adaptive mate choice because everybody in the population is made worse off, right? So what happens? The females are, are choosing the males they love, right? Based on the pick, pick, wang. And they get, and of course, that means their offspring, <laughs> yeah, their male offspring are going to inherit, uh, genes for m making that cool sound with the weird wing bones. But it turns out there's a funny thing going on in birds, which is that the, uh, because they grow so rapidly in the egg and they fledge at almost adult size, the wing bones, the bones of the birds grow before any kind of sexual differentiation begins to happen. So that means that the wing bones are growing before the embryo becomes either male or female. And so until that period, the females actually develop uh, weird wing bones. So when the female chooses that extraordinary male, she's also getting daughters with weirder wing bones who are gonna be, have a harder time flying, a harder time surviving and providing for their offspring. And therefore everybody in the, in the, in the, in the uh, species is getting worse. Right. So, of course, this isn't supposed to happen. Uh, but uh, that and that's the, where uh, the idea of beauty remains, um, uh, you know, a powerful intellectual tool to show uh, the weakness of the idea of, uh, you know, uh, uh, adaptation, adaptation as uh, a dominant force in, 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 in evolutionary process. Uh, beauty matters and it matters to birds as well <laughs> as to people. And, and that, and that, uh, and that has, has evolutionary consequences. So Rick, I mean, all of this stuff about mannequins and the evolution of beauty, it's, it's fascinating. It really is. Um, one thing I've noticed from reading some articles around the time of the publication of your book, uh, so referring particularly to a 2017 New York Times article entitled Challenging Mainstream Thought About Beauty's Big Hand in Evolution. And in that article, you're quoted as saying, I don't know anybody who actually agrees with me. Four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was four years ago. Are more people starting yeah. to agree with you? Is this an idea that's catching on more? I hope that that uh, comment was uh, nihilistic, I, you know, but uh, in, in fact, I think uh, it's a challenge there. You know, I, I, I would say I do have students who, who agree with me, but, you know, that's a compromising <laughs> uh, position. Um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, you know, what, how do you create intellectual change? I, I don't know, right? I, I, I'm trying my best by doing uh, examples of cool science and, and communicating effectively, but uh, it's a challenge. And uh, I'm really hoping that what happens is uh, uh, a bunch of teenagers uh, find uh, the evolution of beauty on their parents' bookshelves or in the library, read it, and then they go into their undergraduate classes and they say, well, well, wait a minute, what about, what about the idea that, you know, sexual selection is merely beautiful? And they get, and they start to do the science and that they, uh, they help change science. Um, 
you know, one of the problems is that science is a very, you know, conservative uh, uh, enterprise, surprisingly. And I think a lot of people um, uh, fear that a life in science is going to be challenging. That they, they got to get job, and they got to get tenure, they got to get grants, and they got to get, you know, uh, that they're competing, and that that uh, tends to make people more homogeneous in how they think. They don't want to stand out too much. So um, uh, I'm hoping that that intellectual change will come. But it does seem from looking at your sort of history of the work you've done that you've often been someone who's been an early advocate for ideas that have since become more widely accepted. I'm talking, for example, about you were one of the early advocates that birds were uh, related to theropod dinosaurs, descended from dinosaurs, which is an idea that we kind of see as quite widely accepted now. But when you were an advocate for it, it was kind of an outlying idea. Uh, have you noticed that yeah. as something that's happened throughout your career? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I think I think uh, you know uh, the, when I first started getting into phylogenetics, it was considered very controversial too, right? Uh, so um, I've also worked on the evolutionary origin of feathers, in particular, you know how how feathers evolved, and uh, in that area. Uh, I went right up against the, 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 the notion that had been popular for a century, that uh, feathers are so obviously uh, adapted for flight uh, that they must have evolved through selection for aerodynamic uh, uh, behavior, like gliding, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it turned out with uh, both paleontological and developmental data showed that that, that really was wrong. And so uh, there have been a couple of times where we've gone up against accepted wisdom and, uh, and it's been working so far. So, uh, um, you know, uh, that gives me confidence. And also, you know, I, 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 um, um, it, it, it's really about, you know, science, you're always thinking about making a contribution that's lasting or enduring. And I really feel that uh, um, this will be an enduring idea and it will have additional impact. What I can say right up though, is one of the aspects of the idea that I think has been really successful it is the idea of the aesthetic frame for thinking about mate choice. It turns out that whether you're adaptationist or not, most biologists today are ready to accept that animals, including birds, are cognitively complicated, that there is something it is like to be a bird making a choice of this male or that male song or, or this partner. And that, uh, uh, and so that, that, that idea of the, that, 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 uh, sexual selection is about aesthetic choice is, is, is still, uh, is, I think, gaining ground. Uh, the idea is whether that's still under natural selection, whether it's still adaptation or, or not, that's, that's a continuing fight. No, I was going to say that you're definitely opening this this kind of new you know field of research for a lot of people to come up with experiments and tests and you know analysis and stuff like totally totally opening the eyes probably to some people just you know there's there's a niche here to work. Yeah, and and uh, you know science is uh, is hard, and so one of the things that makes people do the science they do is to impress their colleagues. And so that leads to kind of groupthink, but ultimately, you know, uh, new ideas, I think, uh, do catch on. And I, I'm optimistic that they will with a, with a, with a new generation. Well, I, what I was going to ask was, and maybe this is just me kind of speculating, but I was wondering if you thought that perhaps the idea, the acceptance of the idea of the evolution of beauty is something that's had maybe quicker uptake among birders, perhaps, than some scientists, just because, I don't know, I think of myself as a birder, I'm not a scientist, but... The idea of appreciating beauty for the sake of beauty and beauty just existing because it's wonderful and spectacular is an idea that I'm fully ready to accept and get on board with because it sounds exactly how I like to relate to birds and nature. Do you think that maybe birders have perhaps been more enthusiastic early adopters of these ideas? I, I, I certainly hope so. And, and one of the reasons why I'm optimistic is because that's who I am. I, I am a birder. I mean, uh, you know, when I talk to... Uh, Uh, the Berkshire Bird Club, the Hoffman Bird Club of the Berkshires, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, groups. These are my people. I, uh, I relate to birders because that, that's really uh, my origin and, and where I remain as a, 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 an interest. So I think this uh, is, is, uh, is an attractive idea. And that's, of course, why to write a popular book, uh, to try to invite a new audience in to share in this debate and then, and then uh, uh, change the culture, change the culture of science and how, how it operates. So, Rick, I know um, that another kind of family of birds that you've been very interested in and have studied in the past have been the Katingas. Um, and this is kind of another 
family that we wanted to talk to you about a little bit because, for example, in previous episodes, I mean, Diego, you probably remember this when we had uh, Jennifer Ackerman on. We were showing her videos. I went to see a, a lek of long wattled umbrella birds and we were trying to kind of break down a bit, you know, because the first thing you think as a non-scientist myself is what possible purpose can this giant, almost life-inhibiting looking appendage that just seems like it would get in the way, what can it possibly serve? And her answer was kind of a, a brief version of what you're talking about here, which was basically just, that's there because a generations of female umbrella birds found that long wattle, I think she said really sexy, right, Diego? I think those were her exact words. Yeah, um, yeah so maybe you can yeah. explain just a little bit more. You know, we were just, we've been looking at bellbirds recently as well. We've been talking a lot about bellbirds and other species with these fairly useless looking little appendages that look beautiful, but don't seem to serve any purpose. Yeah, well, the, uh, you know, the, these are these ornaments, uh, these extreme ornaments are exactly the kind of things that Darwin was uh, concerned about. And, you know, Umbrella Bird is illustrated in the, in the Descent of Man, right? And selection in relation to sex. So he, he was on this, right? And, uh, you know, th uh, these are examples of, uh, of co-evolved extremity, Right. And by coevolution, I mean that, uh, you know, mutations or innovations in display impact uh, what 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 uh, how preference acts on those displays. But innovations in, in, in preference also, uh, you know, a, uh, act on 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 the display. They mutually change one another so that the different species of Katanga or mannequin um, uh, radiate, become different, have, uh, establish distinct um you know, concept of beauty, essentially, because they um, uh, are, are, are individuating or changing over evolutionary time, right? So the, that, that uh, you know, what's fascinating to me is kind of the hierarchy or the, the pattern. So, so, you know, all umbrella birds have this kind of weird umbrella over the head, uh, or, you know, the feathers, and, they, and that requires, again, a kind of uh, developmental magic where they reorient the, 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 the follicles uh, that the feathers grow from in the embryo when it's a chick and then the feathers grow out they're not like twisting they're just differently oriented so that when they grow they grow in this extraordinarily weird weird shape right um uh all those things are examples of uh the extremity of beauty right uh, and and co beauty um, and of course, one, you know, uh, uh, long waddled has a particularly long waddle, but bare, bare necked and goes in a totally different direction. Or the capuchin bird, which is, uh, uh, you know, the sister group to, uh, uh, to umbrella birds, ends up where the male and female look the same, but they've all got bald crowns that are kind of slaty blue. You know, it's, it, it, it's, you can't make this stuff up. And that's what's so uh, inspiring about thinking about evolution uh, aesthetically is that it, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, boundlessly creative, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, to, you know, uh, you know, it, mannequins and cartoons are fascinating to me and remain, uh, you know, a kind of personal obsession uh, because they are so aesthetically extreme. These are the families where, you know, things really go nuts. Uh, like, also like bowerbirds and birds of paradise. And um, that makes them, you know, kind of endlessly compelling. Actually, actually, I, I take advantage that Chris brought that question. And, you know, Rick, you, you've been a professor. You've, you've got so many students on so many different levels, on, you know, undergrad and postgrad. How do, you, how, do you, how do you make clear and how do you get these, you know, students and sometimes people not in the academia to understand that evolution doesn't necessarily follow a purpose that is random and that things are just kind of because... How do you how do you how do you you know phrase that explanation shortly here for us? <laughs> I hope I do it well, but uh, but you know it's always a challenge. And one of the things is I think it's easier to get the, the idea of the you know uh, contingency of history, the idea of, of accidental influences uh, having a critical impact uh, on people who are uh, maybe less educated. It's really the real challenge are the people who have had a classic background. Uh, who 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 imagine um, uh, uh, you know adaptation as a strong force that would control mm -hmm. uh, the, you know evolutionary history in a in a predictable or goal oriented way, right? This, of course, is the same idea that uh, that uh, 
uh, Stephen Jay Gould was getting at in his book, Wonderful Life, which is about the Burgess Shale, yeah. you know, going back exactly. and asking, hey, look, if you play any, if you play the tape of life over again, the history of life over and over again, you're not going to get the same result. Look at this little worm. It's the least distinguished, uh, you know, uh, member of the Burgess Shale fauna, this, you know, uh, Cambrian, early Cambrian fossils from 500 million years ago, was like, well, that's our, that's the closest thing to our ancestor, right? So, you know, uh, that, and, and, and you imagine it as being successful compared to lots of other experiments and evolutionary biology is, is different. So I guess it's through examples and, and also just uh, asking questions, different questions than people uh, anticipate. Cool, yeah, probably other thing, you know, like uh, Lamarckian, you know, giraffes growing necks and stuff like that and building on that. So we have this uh, little quick fire round of questions that we like to throw to all of our guests. Sometimes, you know, the questions are tweaked a little bit depending on the guest's um, interest or area of expertise. So we have a few of those for you as well. So the first one, um, binoculars, eights or tens? Ten. Okay. Okay. Diego and I are both Why? in the eight camp, I think. Why, Why tens? Well, you know, I got into bird watching because my eyes weren't great, you know. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I, need all the, I need all the help I could get. I mean, you know? <laughs> okay. So the next question, um, and you've sort of answered this in a previous one, but I'll, I'll tweak it a bit. So I was going to, I normally say favorite bird, but I might say favorite bird family. And I think I might know the answer, but I'll say it anyway. Favorite bird family? Mannequins. I, I think yeah, I can't. I can't. I can't go anywhere else. Though it could be. I could. Maybe I just work to to answer that question appropriately. I'll just try to uh, change the science so that mannequins and katingas are in the same family. How about that? There we go. Yeah, okay. you're, you're, I like it. Like super family. I'll, I'll, super I'll just, family. I'll just re. Yeah. I'll just reclassify them. Yeah, yeah. That's got to be the ultimate bird family, right? If we put mannequins and contingas together, that would be the champion yeah, of all champions. Absolutely. Champion. Actually, Chris, absolutely, yeah. related related to that question, and this is you know uh, another of this quick fire, Rick. Uh, if you're a researcher, what do you prefer, exploded or cluster legs? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I like I like the spatially dispersed legs. Cool. That's what I, that's that's that vocal that's, that's vocal I, you know. Yeah, contingas and stuff yes, like that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, indeed. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, Next one, um, favorite all-time bird display? Um, you know, to me, the, uh, the golden-winged mannequin, just, you know, flying down to a log, jumping up, turning around midair, and landing back on the log, facing back in the direction that it's come in, you know, and seeing that for the first time uh, was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. And... Yeah, and and it really it was a huge kind of discovery in my in my research career, and so that display has you know just unbelievable meaning to me. But well, speaking of, of that, Rick, the next question I was going to ask is what what bird display do you most dream of seeing that you've never seen live? Absolutely, Argus pheasant. I, I may not be happy if I if I if I don't see that display before I die, you know. But I got to work hard to do it, so I better get started now. <laughs> so Rick, we've talked a lot about these amazing places around the world that you visited in search of birds to study and to go birding. But uh, we always ask guests who come on this, what what would you say was your your favorite, your top global birding destination of all the places you visited? What really, really. Uh, inspires me is uh, southeastern Brazil, that that area of the world, uh, Mata Atlantica from, you know, uh, from southern Sao Paulo up through uh, the northeast. It's a, it's, it's a fantastic area. You know, I, I, I've now birded on every continent and uh, um, I keep uh, traveling to destinations outside of South America and, and finding that the birds to me, just aren't as interesting as the birds in South America. <laughs> and so I, I have a lot more places to bird to demonstrate that to myself. Uh, but part of me would rather see, you know, 20, 30 lifers in, in South America uh, than, than to go to another continent and, uh, and work for 200 or 300, right? It's a, it's a, a, a they, they, you know, so the South American continent is also, uh, uh, you know, where my heart really lies. And actually from the Atlantic forest there in Southeast Brazil, which is like the most interesting or crazy Cotinga mannequin, you know, lacking thing you've, you've witnessed? Ilicura probably? Sure, sure. Ilicura is awesome. Ili uh, Ilicura is pin, pintail, pintail mannequin. Pintail, yeah. Thank pintail you, mannequin. Diego. Thank and, you and, for and, the, <laughs> the novice over <laughs> and, and, 
I, I also really love. I also really love uh, the the what is it? Black and gold Katinga, the Tijuca Atra. You you, uh, you you change it to Lipagus, I think. No, like, yeah, it is. Oh. It is now Lipagus. It's now Lipagus <laughs> Atra. Sorry, uh, and I I did that myself. What are, I love the genus Tijuca, but anyway, this is a a, 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 a South uh, you know Brazilian Katinga, and they, they have a. The, the male sings a song. They are polygynous. The male sings a song. You know, has a very slowly rising. Yeah, super high pitch then. Right, and then what happens is another one starts singing. That's only you know ten meters, five meters away, and they're off cycle. So they 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 create this like almost hallucinogenic. Um, uh, you know, experience with the beat frequencies uh, uh, between the vocalizations, it's just uh, unimaginable, uh, really. And uh, uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an example of an extraordinary ornithological experience from Southeast Brazil. <laughs> well, there we go, Make, I wanna go, I wanna go, I have to go. Bird show field trip, oh, Diego, it. let's go, Southeast Brazil. Great, great bird in there, man, absolutely. So, Rick, I mean, just to finish up, I mean, once again, and I feel like I say this to all the guests, but this this time, it, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, and I'm sure that I've got a lot to learn, and I've, I've managed to learn some of it from reading your, your first book, but we have uh, the exciting news that you have a new book upcoming, The Beauty of Birds. What can you tell us about that? In The Evolution of Beauty, there was this, this, uh, this long argument that lasts, you know, for the whole arc of the book uh, about about the nature of evolutionary biology. And, um, you know, that left me with, uh, it's packed with birds, but just not enough. And believe it or not, you know, the only way to have a successful book is to listen to your editors. <laughs> and so they were <laughs> chopping it. You can't talk about that. That's how, how, where do you put that? That doesn't belong here. And so um, I realized, you know, frustratedly that, that there was another kind of simultaneous view of, of the beauty of birds that it wasn't getting across. And that's, um, you know, kind of the natural history of beauty. So uh, upcoming book is really a natural history of beauty. I think of it as media and genre in, in avian aesthetics. What does that really mean? Well, media is <laughs> like, how are they communicating visually by color or vocally, you know, through song or, or tactily or physically through display, right? So these are all kind of different media that, 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 that beauty can exist in. Um, and then genre is really about the context in the natural history of the birds. Like there's mate choice, of course, but there's also like parent offspring relations, right? Egg colors are really uh, striking and, you know, more diverse than they need to be for mere camouflage, right? What is going on there? Well, that's another kind of aesthetic evolution. Also birds through uh, feeding on fruits and flowers are agents in the aesthetic evolution of plants, right? So these are other examples of how beauty works in ornithology and, uh, and in bird biology. So I think of it as a kind of, um, you know, ornithology interpreted through the lens of beauty, right? <laughs> and uh, in that sense, it's a, a different perspective on this topic. And I get uh, to talk a lot more about uh, 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 you know, things like structural color uh, and, uh, and song learning and all sorts of stuff that's critical to bird beauty, but uh, uh, never even got touched on in the evolution of beauty. Well, it all sounds fascinating. I can't wait to read it. Do, do we know when, when we can expect that book to, oh, be, to be on I'd our have shelves? To say, I'd, have to say, I'd have to say I'm doing too much birding and not enough writing at the moment. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, that's uh, partly Diego's uh, fault, right? You've got to I, stop going to Costa Rica I, and taking in birding. We want to read the book. And, and it's going to be your fault, like, you know, in a month time that right. we're going to be birding together well, in Costa Rica. And, 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 uh, but uh, but I'm, uh, it, 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 it'll be a couple of years off. But uh, uh, I'm on it. Well, I can't wait to read it again. And, well, as always, everyone who's watching uh, all of the information, Rick's websites and, and where you can follow his work will be uh, linked in the, the, uh, the comments below. And, well, I think I just have to say, Rick, thanks so much for joining us on The Birdie Show. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you for the last hour or so. It's a pleasure. And uh, so we'll have to uh, do it again sometime and talk about duck sex, uh, we did, which we didn't even get to. Well, all right, there we go. Rick Prom part two, duck sex, upcoming on The Birdie Show. I look forward to it. <laughs> We've got to pencil it in. Thanks so much. Thank, good to see you. Thanks, mate. Diego, good to see you. I'll see you soon. Absolutely. As ever, thanks for joining me. Yeah, cheers right. and, you know, another great episode. 
Thanks again for watching The Birders Show. I hope you just enjoyed that really fascinating episode with Rick Prom. I've got a lot of reading to do to learn a little bit more about the evolution of beauty uh, and the beauty of birds in his upcoming book. Uh, and as ever, please do remember to like this video, subscribe, share, comment, and hit the notification bell for all the latest updates from The Birders Show. And of course, check out our Patreon and help us to support our mission of making birding more accessible for people all around the world. Thanks again.